Good evening. Welcome to the Decision 2006 Mayoral Candidate Forum. I am Dr. Ham Shivani, the President of California State University of Stanislaus. I will be moderating tonight's Candidate Forum. We're pleased to have all three candidates running for Mayor of Turlock here this evening. D.J. Franson, John Lazar, and Kurt Vanderweide. Gentlemen, thank you for your participation. We at California State University of Stanislaus look forward to strengthening our partnership with the city of Turlock and together building a university community that will attract students, faculty, businesses, residents, and tourists to this great town. Tonight's forum will begin with three-minute opening statements from each candidate in alphabetical order. After the opening statements, I will ask all three candidates a series of questions to which they will have one minute each to respond. The members of our audience who represent a variety of industries throughout the community will ask the remaining questions. The forum will end with one minute closing remarks by each candidate. To our audience at home, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Mr. Franson. Hi, um, thank you for having us. Um, uh, my name is DJ Franson, and I'm running for mayor of Turlock. Um, I work for the city of Turlock currently, and I own a business called TurlockCityNews.com. And what prompted me to run for mayor was I thought I had something to add since I've uh, since I've been born and raised here in Turlock, and I feel that I'm connected to the community, and I want to inform the community. And my main platform issue is improving communication and interaction between our community leaders and the rest of us in the community. Um, one of the important things that I believe right now in Turlock that we're facing is the fact that a lot of us don't know what's going on. And I'm willing to do that, to go above and beyond. I know it's not the city's job to do, um, to make sure we're all informed and educated, but I want to go above and beyond in that. I want to create a lot of partnerships with organizations that are here, um, for example, like the university. I don't think that's been really um, created yet, and I want to see that happen. Um, I do have some roots here in Turlock. My grandparents, uh, John and Catherine Martinez, they've been um, involved in Turlock stuff a long time, passed away. My grandparents, Everett Franson and Carmen, um, they've also been involved, helped build Columbia Pool and I've just been raised with Turlock principles. But I'm not so disconnected that I know that most of Turlock isn't from Turlock anymore. And that's pretty much my main reason for running for mayor. I want to bring something to the present council that I don't think is there yet. And hopefully they'll make a better place and all of Turlock can say that they were represented by me. Thank you, Mr. Franzen. Thank you. Uh, Mr. John Lazar, class of 1981, Thank CSU you. Stanislaus. Thank you. My name is John Lazar, and I'm a lifelong member of the Turlock community. Born in Turlock in 1959, attended Turlock schools, and also uh, Cal State University Stanislaus, graduating in 1981. Very proud of you. Well, thank you. Um, I'm a businessman here in Turlock. Um, I'm raising my family here. I have three children, along with my wife, Nellie. We have three wonderful children, and think Turlock's a wonderful place to bring them up and raise our family. Um, I've been on the Turlock City Council for 14 years, currently serving as vice mayor. Um, been involved in uh, the Stanislaus County Local Agency Formation Commission, make and like to do so as mayor. The um, reason I'm running for mayor is I have a vision of what I believe Turlock uh, should be and can be, and it looks to the past. I, I think that among all the cities in the San Joaquin Valley, Turlock's probably uh, the leader among peers. Um, I think we offer leadership to other cities in terms of how to grow the community properly with managed, controlled growth, um, respecting development, but also making sure that our agricultural heritage is uh, represented and respected as well. I believe that uh, that vision should include growth uh, in those areas where agricultural lands aren't as fertile as uh, some of the other in the, the, the north northwest and uh, far East. Um, I believe that we should support the, the uh, general plan of Turlock and that envisions uh, future managed growth going south of Turlock. Those are some of the things that I think uh, we need to 
kind of look for in our future mayor, someone that can lead us uh, down the road where we have a general plan and can follow in that direction, uh, improve our police and fire um, and public safety services and transportation. But I'm sure we'll be discussing that uh, later on. In any event, it's a pleasure being here. I appreciate your leadership here at Cal State Stanislaus. Um, I welcome the opportunity to continue the relationship. I know Major, Mayor Andre has opened up a dialogue between the university along with um, the Turlock School District, and I want to be a part of the future in that regard as well. Thank you, Mr. Lula. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kurt Vandeweyer. Always a class fun name of, to say. Class of 1990. 1990. As well as Master of Public Administration. 1996. 1996. Very proud of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And I, I'm learning to pronounce your name. Van de Vida. You've just got it, just about nailed it now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shervani. My name is Kurt Van der Weyde. I am, uh, uh, I am a 18-year uh, resident of the city of Turlock. I moved here in 1988 uh, to continue my studies here at school, make it easy to walk across the street and come to classes. Wow. Um, Sank roots here in 1990, same time I graduated uh, uh, graduated from the school. I sank roots here with my wife and we started to raise a family and uh, went back to school obviously. Got my master's degree in public administration in 1996. Uh, in 1998 I went to work for Assemblyman Greg Agazer or uh, Assemblyman George House, followed by Assemblyman Dave Cogdill in the year 2000, and then most recently for Assemblyman Greg Agazarian. Uh, during that time, I learned some very basic principles of what it means to be an elected leader, and those uh, largely, uh, I think we could we could call them accessibility and accountability. Those are two of the, the key ingredients of a of a good, effective leader: is that you are accessible to the public and you're accountable to them. Um, that's one thing that I think is in great need in this city. Uh, Turlock is a city in transformation right now. The community is transforming. The administration, we're currently seeing a transformation happening there. And this, this election represents a transformation in its leadership. What I want to do is help create a culture of accountability and accessibility among my colleagues on the council. And I think it is all summed up in one word, it's servanthood. I think a good leader has to be a servant because it's not about being the boss. It's about being a servant. That is why I'm running for mayor, because I think that is the prime value that needs to be brought to this administration and into this council. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, now we will begin our uh, questions from each candidate. Let me start with the first question. Each of you have one minute, starting with Mr. Franson. Okay. What do you see um, as the biggest problem facing in Turlock today? and or in the future? Okay, um, the biggest problem I believe, I think I already stated it, is uh, the lack of communication and interaction. Um, again, I don't believe that people know what's going on with their government and um, it's a huge problem because it affects every other decision made. We have problems right now that probably wouldn't be problems if it were to have been communicated better, such as the homeless shelter, um, the super Walmart issue, growth, the recent um, issue that came up, the apartment complex, that was a big one that pointed to misinformation, miscommunication. And so those are all problems that come from that. And luckily I do believe that um, Turlock will be able to overcome it with this election process right here. That's what I'm bringing, I'm offering to at least let people know what's going on. and. Um, so yeah, obviously that's the biggest problem right now, and I think it could be a big problem in the future, unless people change it. Thank you, Mr. Franzen. Thank Mr. you. Lazar. Well, <clears throat> as far as issues go, I think the, the biggest uh, potential problem, if we don't plan for it uh, properly, is growth. And um, I think that with all the uh, development and growth in the Central Valley and each community experience it, if we don't plan it properly, there's a lot of inherent problems that can be associated with it if it's done wrongly. Just look to Los Banas or Ceres or even Modesto, and that's how not to grow. Uh, we've done our homework here. We have um, master plan communities um, and uh, CFA uh, fees associated with development, which 
new growth pays for itself, including uh, fees for new police and fire. Infrastructure is put in, roads go in. We have a partnership with the school district, so we build around future uh, school sites like we did in Pittman area. We have uh, boundaries that we've uh, identified, the north boundary is Taylor Road in Turlock, and I'd like to see us adhere to it. I'd also, uh, also like to, to commit to not allowing our industrial area to grow into our housing area, which would occur if we jumped the freeway and road houses over on the west side of the freeway. So I think that that's the challenge we face in the future growth. Thank you, Mr. Lozak. Mr. Van Der There's two challenges, really. One is cultural. cultural. One is the, the responsibilities shared by both the leadership and the administration. And that has largely to do with, with the accessibility, the accountability, the communication. And the other is, is growth. That's the long-term issue that we're going to have to face. Um, I believe that uh, next year we're going to be doing a reevaluation, a uh, revisiting of our general plan, our 20-year general plan. It's done on a five-year increments. Next year is 15 years. Um, I would like to take that opportunity to take uh, to get started on a new general plan the next 20 years and take that opportunity to really integrate it with a larger regional effort to do some regional planning, get everybody on the same page, adjoining communities and counties so that we're all sharing a vision for what this, this uh, valley is going to look like. Thank you, sir. Let's go to the second question. What one thing would you most want to accomplish in your first term as a mayor? Mr. Francis? I would really love to accomplish um, and help create an informed and educated City of Turlock um, concerning the City of Turlock decision-making process. Um, that's one of my biggest issues and it will be, and I'd love to be part of that um, solution. I would also like to go with that, sorry, I would also like to go with that as far as saying that we have to be accountable and um, I would just like to be able to do that by letting everyone know what's going on. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on within our city that there's no reason why people shouldn't be getting press releases or information every day from our city of Turlock and so yeah, I'd like to accomplish that and it wouldn't take my first term to do it, it'd take the first day. <laughs> so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, I, I believe we're already doing it, but I'd like to enhance it, and that's hiring more police and firefighters. I, I think we need to enhance the police force. We've had the opportunity to hire some more this last year and backfill what we, we had, um, and that's kind of where we need to go, provide for the public safety, um, and we're, we're making a good start with our new police chief. He has some great innovati innovative ideas, um, a lot of energy, and a lot of respect from the force with the police, firefighters. Um, uh, same thing, we're hiring more firefighters and I just think that's the number one duty of local government is provide for the public safety and uh, that would be my focus the first year. <clears throat> Thank you, sir. Mr. Vandewather. Well, I've already touched on the general plan. That That is a very, uh, very prominent objective for my first term, but also to grow our region's economy, not just, not just Turlock's economy, but the regional economy because when we do that, we're generating the revenue, the resources that we need to operate the city, the money that we need to hire more police and more firefighters to help our, fix our streets, to take care of those infrastructural issues that we're, we're experiencing right now. Shortage of police and firefighters. We have to get more competitive to bring those police and firefighters into the city and to keep them. And the only way we can do that is by growing our economy and expanding our revenue base. Thank you, sir. Third question. If elected to mayor, what steps would you take to partner with CSU Stanislaus <laughs> in building a university community in Turlock, a college town? Mr. France. The first steps I would take would also involve um, communicating and interacting. That's a big thing that hasn't been done. Um, I do think that we need to improve the way we think and the way that we have um, accepted the university. I don't think we've done it fully. I believe that events would be a very good idea, something like a downtown parade. Um, just a community involvement is a big thing that I believe would be great. Um, I also think as far as, because we have some very valuable uh, resource here as far as graduates go, I would like to see some kind of internship, a little bit, a little bit more than we already do. That's a, we have uh, great people here that are graduating that we could use at the city of Turlock 
and we could promote that a little bit more. And I think that we really need to improve the way we think, though. Like, for example, the concert that was canceled, um, I just don't think that we're really accepting the university and what a college brings. Thank you, sir. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Lazar. Well, I, again, I'd like to continue the work of Mayor Andre and, and continuing the dialogue with yourself, uh, including the school district and the superintendent kind of bridging all the educational uh, leaders in town in that dialogue. But I think one area that we could really be partners and participate is uh, working with you and developing your research and development department um, and reaching out to uh, Silicon Valley, other s areas of California to go get good quality jobs, ask them to come and look at Turlock, relocate here, open uh, facilities here to hire uh, people here and, and do what Kurt says, uh, improve our economy utilize the west side industrial plan, take advantage of our um, uh, industrial zoning there, um, and just kind of expand on what, what we've laid the found work, uh, groundwork for and utilize your skills and your energy uh, to make this a university town. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Van Der I've heard it said that Turlock and the university have been, uh, what is it, dating for a long time. For 45 years. Well, I would say, you know, we haven't even been dating. We've just been introduced and we're kind of watching each other come from across the dance hall. We need to start dating at, at, at the very least and then get married. But you've had some great ideas. I think the idea of the, um, of the uh, television and uh, broadcasting center downtown, that's a fantastic idea. We've talked about that. Um, I'd like to develop some partnerships with regard to uh, internships working with the city. I would love to see you develop a top-notch engineering department here in town because that's one area we really need help in downtown is getting access to good quality engineers. And I think with if we had a program like that, we could really create some wonderful partnerships. Appreciate it. Looking forward to working with any of you. <laughs> um, next question. How can the city of Turlock partnered with K-12 schools <coughs> and CSU Stanislas to promote lifelong learning? More broader education question. Okay. Um, as far as that, the um, city's role, I don't really know exactly what we can do except for to promote um, education, to actually promote the university. It should be a cornerstone of our community and obviously that is uh, furthering education. Um, most of the students from Turlock aren't able to, or aren't, aren't Stanislaus State University ready, and I think that that's something that we need to promote by um, facilitating meetings, um, organizations such as that. As far as on the lower level, on the lower grade level, we already do that with some after school programs. I do like incorporating the recreation department with that, keeping the kids there at school, making it fun, interesting. And then um, also just by um, working with the high school students, I think uh, some kind of a work program would also be great because most jobs that we have at the city of Turlock also require some degrees. So it could be something that they have a goal to look forward to. Thank you, Mr. Francis. Thank you. Mr. Lazar. I think what Mr. Franson said is uh, appropriate. I think in partnering with um, uh, the school districts as well as the university and encouraging in internships at the city level and also working with our recreational uh, department to create after school uh, programs and projects. One of the, the, the consequences of uh, forcing the soccer teams off the fields back in the 90s was a bad feeling amongst a lot of young people that the university didn't want them. And, we, we developed the, the soccer fields uh, for them in uh, Northwest Turlock. And I think that sort of thing needs to kind of be dissuaded and kind of bringing back young people onto the campus and let them have the experience of being around uh, college students. But um, as far as uh, teaching programs, bringing uh, alumni and, and um, student teachers onto campuses to work with uh, students in the public schools as well as private schools. Thank you, sir. Mr. Vanderwater. I'd like to see you know, work throughout the strata, the social strata of, of Turlock. You know, leaders can use their skills, their network to talk with each other, to build relationships, to create a shared vision of what Turlock should be in terms of its education, but then also use the resources of the university to interact with the, the citizens of the, of the community. For example, um, when we do the Turlock Alternative to Gangs and we'd have the, the, the community fairs out in the community, I know you've offered your support to have 
have uh, student athletes come out and show the kids out there what it's like to, to attend a university and, and to create some interest and some value for education for them. Now, I think those are the important things that we, some of the important things that we can do, but really the dialogue, the relationships, the network, and creating a shared ver vision for uh, an educational future, working with uh, local leaders, uh, working with our superintendent of public instruction here in the county and in the city, and uh, that's, that's how I would go about it. Great. Thank you very much. Next question. Stanislaus County is experiencing a tremendous amount of growth. Estimates are that population will double in the next 10 years, adding almost 1 to 2 million people to the valley. How do you intend to prepare for and manage the growth, knowing that many of these people are likely to settle in Turlock? because there is a great university and a great hospital <laughs> and all the other amenities. Turlock Irrigation District, all sorts of wonderful things. Absolutely. Mr. Francis. Um, the first thing is, is that the question actually and the statements actually point to it is that we have to expect for it to come and we have to plan great for it. I think that's everything is planning. Um, a lot of people may be disillusioned that there's some way that we're going to stop this. We are San Francisco's affordable housing we are a great community that people would want to live in no matter where they're from and we have great services so you have to plan really well for it i think that when it comes we need to get as much as we can uh, financially i know we have assessment fees which people pay to take care of their specific areas i think we need to go above that and we need to have a better um, developer agreements so that we can get money for our general fund because new residents do use Main Street, Crane Park, um, all of their services while they're out in the city, not just their specific area. So we just need to plan for it and make sure we get what we need. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lazar? I agree. I think uh, managed growth, uh, planning for the future is uh, important. Uh, we've done a good job, I believe, by kind of setting our northern boundary and following the general plan. Um, working with these uh, master plan communities uh, assures that developers pay their fair way. Uh, parks are provided for, police and uh, firefighters are provided for, infrastructure is put in. We're, we're not going to look like some of these other valley communities. We're, we're doing it right. And I think just uh, making sure we continue with that method and plan is important. Um, and engaging the public through the uh, update on the general plan and, and revising that. You know, a government isn't uh, five people sitting on a council and Turlock running the show. The public is encouraged to participate and through workshops and forums and meetings in various quadrants of the city, we've, we've done those kind of things and reached out to the community. And, and there is a dialogue. There's, there's a listening as well as a acting on behalf of the city council in Turlock. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Mr. Van Der I've mentioned that our, uh, we're 14 years into our 20-year general plan. And even though our next general plan will be another 20 years, I think we do need to use that opportunity to look even farther out and work not just as a community, but as a region look into the future, look at the mistakes that other, other uh, metropolitan areas have made time and time and time again. We need to avoid those kind of mistakes, learn from their mistakes, and see what kind of options are available to us, not just as, as a city, once again, but also as a region. We need to be talking with Houston. We need to be talking with Ceres. We need to be talking with Stanislaw County. We need to be talking with adjoining counties, and not even just here in the valley, but up into the, up into the foothills as well, because they share our future. We all have a shared future, and we all want to preserve the values and the, uh, the resources that we have enjoyed here in this valley. Our way of life is dependent upon that. And so we, we do need to do that advance, uh, that look into the crystal ball and, and look and see what's coming and, take, and plan for it. More regional perspective. More regional perspective. Thank you, sir. Next question. Uh, the state places a strict mandate on cities uh, to promote more affordable housing. We also need more good paying local jobs. As you know, more jobs and more <coughs> housing clearly means more growth. How do you balance the demand for growth and community concerns about traffic congestion and other challenges related to the growth? Mr. Franson. And we only have one minute? <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I do believe that one of the major things that we need to think about when we're talking about growing is we need to plan on going west of the freeway. We will grow that way eventually, 
So we might as well plan for it now. That helps with traffic because we can use uh, 99 for a north to south expressway. And we also won't have traffic traveling the same uh, thoroughfares, which they're residential streets now, but they're light thoroughfares because they go straight to the most uh, um, trafficked areas, a gear road, Monta Vista crossings. So if you have people uh, traveling to the center of town, which should be the freeway, and that should run north to south, then that'll help that. I believe when you're talking about growth too, you need to think about economic growth. Um, I think that we need businesses that aren't driven by a, a population. One of the proposed ideas I had was an outlet mall, and that brings revenue in, and it doesn't create crosstown and residential traffic. It's on and off the freeway, we get the revenue, and something to do for the citizens' amenities. Thank you, Mr. Lazar. Well, I think you, you have to respect agriculture and, and the nature of the west side of the freeway and also re respect the south uh, end of that area where industry has been set up to do business and you don't want to grow houses next to industry uh, and you end up with a lot of problems in that regard. But as far as transportation goes, I think uh, we could be proud that we have a fixed uh, route bus system now in Turlock to provide um, mass transit for our citizens work with uh, the county on their efforts to bring some sort of um, rail down into the valley, sort of like what they have in, in Tracy. But also it might be an opportunity to say that I support uh, Measure K that provides um, a half cent sales tax uh, increase for roads in our area and make uh, Stanislaus a uh, self-help county. Turlock will get some revenues, I think 1.7 million, to help with our uh, repairs and fixing of roads as well as a new interchange here. It's wonderful. I got the Thank fist. You. Thank you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Van <Vandelein. laughs> Well, when we talk about growth, we're really talking about three major subtypes. We're talking about residential, commercial, and industrial. Uh, residential, probably we've, we've maybe overbuilt a little bit, and we're seeing the result of that right now with uh, a, a retraction in the market. Not as many homes are being built, and we have uh, a surplus of approximately 400 on the market right now, if I'm not wrong. Approximately 400. So we're seeing a correction in that, and uh, really more residential growth is, I don't, seeing the cooling in that, it's less of a concern for me now, and I, I kind of welcome the cooling. It's good to see. Uh, we've had some good commercial growth, and I think we could do better. Uh, that provides jobs, it provides more shopping opportunities for us, and it once again provides the revenue for our city. But we also need those good industrial jobs, those wealth creation jobs that contribute both to the residents and to the community. And that helps us keep our traffic down by keeping people in town instead of having to drive out of the area. They're right here. Job is here, shopping here, living here. Self-contained. Um, now the last question. Uh, this question you already, all of you have alluded to, but it's very important to many of us residents of City of Turlock. How do you plan to address the current understaffing of the Turlock's police force, Mr. Francis? I would like to see um, overtime spending cut. Currently, um, last I heard from Chief Hampton, we, the City of Turlock spent $800,000 in a year in overtime. I think if we just cut that and got these police officers, um, I, I'd see that as, an, as a way to solve the problem. I do know that there's a shortage of police officers, I mean everywhere. Um, people talk about raising pay, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea because that goes on to retirement and we're having big issues with that. Public safety members are expensive to get and they end up costing more. I do believe maybe looking into bonuses, maybe in um, housing uh, assistance, so maybe someone that likes to uh, work in Turlock just as I like to live in Turlock and we can help them get their life started in a career that maybe they're choosing. So um, that's a big way, I think, is uh, cutting overtime spending and offering um, some kind of incentive to move here. Thank you, sir. Mr. Lazar? Well, the council has budget budgeted uh, to hire several new police officers and uh, unfortunately it's, it's a long process and, and we can't just hire them overnight. Um, but I know the new chief is making efforts to get uh, that going and hopefully um, by the end of the year we'll have several online. Um, as far as paying for them, uh, Kurt has alluded to the fact that bringing more quality jobs to this area will help bring more revenue to help hire new officers. Also, as I said earlier, uh, the master p planning of communities, any new growth um, includes a fee to pay for new police and fire officers. Um, but frankly, we have a new 
uh, police chief who has some great innovative ideas. Looking forward to working with him, uh, deferring to him on some of those decisions. But as far as um, providing him whatever uh, ability we can financially, I'll certainly commit to that because I believe in him. Thank you, sir. Mr. Van Der Weide. As do I. He's a, he's a very good man, one of the best investments we ever made. Um, Chief Hampton has shared with us that it takes about an hour to get, or an hour, a year to get a new police officer started from the very beginning all the way up to where they're on the street. And when that happens, it ends up that we end up being a training ground for them and they get lured away by other communities that are paying more. Uh, that's the challenge we face. We're able to train them, but we're continually losing them through uh, competition, through retirements, and uh, sometimes through injury. We need to find a way to keep them here, to make it more attractive. We need to compete more effectively in the personnel marketplace so that we can train our employees, we can keep them here, and we can compete with other communities to, haps, per, to perhaps bring in some of those lateral transfers that are called trained, uh, trained police officers, trained firefighters, bring them in from other communities so they can get on the job quicker instead of having to wait the whole year. And it all comes down to growing the economy. Thank you, sir. I appreciate uh, all the candidates. Uh, and now we are going to move uh, to our industry representatives, starting with Dr. Bill Gibson, superintendent of uh, Turlock School District. I have a question. The Turlock schools and the city of Turlock have had a model collaboration regarding youth facilities. What would you be able to do to increase the ability of our students and the city to collaboratively use athletic facilities both owned by the school district and the city? May I remind the candidates that one minute <coughs> is the response oh, time. Okay. Well, um, currently I, I think we already have a good partnership with the school district. I know that we have um, basically like a swapping agreement. Um, we both can use each other's facilities. I think that we need to stay on that and um, and basically support our youth. I mean, they're our future. I think anything that the city of Turlock has should be the school districts. I mean, that's all there is to it. Thank you. Well, I also want to thank the school district because without your participation, a lot of our recreational uh, programs wouldn't be a reality, including soccer, basketball, uh, swimming. swimming as yeah. well. Yeah, and Big time. Um, in any event, I, I support wholeheartedly uh, collaborative efforts between the city and the, and the school district and plan to continue the leadership that Mayor Andre has given in the, that direction. That's great. Thank you. Well, we're both public agencies, so it's you would think it's a no-brainer, but a lot of times it's not. There's a lot of dialogue that needs to occur, I think, both between the, uh, the City Council and the Board and between administration to come up with some innov innovative solutions to some of the challenges that we have. Um, right now, we have the uh, sports complex and it's just adjoining to Pittman High School. I know that one of the plans for parking, for example, was that uh, parents could park at the high school and then walk over. But that's not working out as well, so perhaps we need to open the dialogue again and see if there are some different options that we can come up with to, to develop uh, better parking facilities, at least for parents. But then once again, that goes to also helping out with the kids because they're all our kids and they're sure. all attending the schools. Right, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Kirsten. Mr. Dale Butler, class of 1972, CSU staff. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Dale Butler, I'm president of the Hispanic Leadership Council of Stanislaus County. And my question has to do with qualifications. Can you uh, tell me, in terms of uh, special skills, knowledges, and abilities that you possess that would make you a successful uh, candidate or a, a mayor, so what are those qualifications? Okay. Mr. Francis. Um, as far as specific qualifications according to a specific skill, I don't think I actually am required to have any as far as from what I see what it takes to run for mayor. Um, you know, resident of Turlock, registered voter 18 and over, I think I got that. Um, I think that you need to be able to communicate. I think I'm doing that. I think I'm a leader in the community with my business, TurlockCityNews.com, um, which also studies Turlock, basically engulfs me in Turlock. And from a a business owner's point of view, a citizen's point of view, and hopefully a future leader of Turlock's point of view. Um, I do also work for the city of Turlock. If you want to know anything about an organization, work for it, especially down in the trenches, and you'll learn a lot. I've learned a lot from there. Um, my, Like I stated before in my opening statement, both my grandparents are from here, so I've been raised in Turlock principal, 
and I believe knowing the history of Turlock is important because it's affected all the decisions made now and will affect all the decisions made later. So thank you. I think uh, one of my strengths is always trying to find the middle ground to bring consensus and bring bridge the gap between two diverse ideas. If, if there's contention, try to find the middle ground and uh, bring both sides to agree on an issue. Um, I have the experience uh, of being involved in government sort of like Kurt. I, I worked for a state assemblyman, a congressman, um, and I know a little bit about state and federal government as well. Um, while I've been on the council, I, I've also had the opportunity to uh, meet with various citizens group. I've, I've made it a point to reach out to um, questionable issues in, in communities and in, in, uh, neighborhoods such as the DMV when it relocated in the north area of Turlock, um, a daycare that wasn't welcome in a neighborhood and those kind of issues. So I, I made it a point, whether it wasn't very pleasant, but I made a point to meet with the neighborhood and try to find a common ground so we can move forward on the issue. And that's why I intend to do as mayor if I'm elected. I think it goes beyond knowledge, skills, and abilities and also embraces the dimension of values as well. I started driving tractor for my dad when I was five years old. I started swinging a hammer, building barns with him when I was 12, and he taught me the value of good hard work and sweat equity. And uh, that, I think, is, is something that is really needed. Also, having worked for the three different assembly members and uh, developing the network throughout the, uh, throughout the region, really. It has prepared me to not just deal with local issues here, but also regional issues, state issues, and, and bridge those gaps. Um, I I've, I've really am very proud of some of the things I've done uh, bridging some of those gaps, working for those assembly members, and, and creating relationships that have had really positive results. Um, you, really, you really understand the, uh, the value of success when you get two adjoining uh, county supervisors from adjoining counties who don't always see eye to eye to come to an agreement on something that's very contentious and I've happened to have helped broker deals like that and it's been very rewarding. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Mr. John Sixbury. Thank you. Gentlemen, uh, it's great to see you all again. Uh, I know the city does not have any direct responsibility for the provision of health care in the community, but how you handle certain constituent populations certainly affects uh, an organization like Emanuel Medical Center. Uh, we're the provider of last resort in our community, and uh, one of those growing burdens that we have is the homeless in our community, not just medical indigency, but, but folks without any address, without any means. Uh, they become a burden to the system and certainly a burden to a private uh, organization like mine. I haven't heard uh, you address that, and I'd be interested in hearing your views on how we uh, solve what seems to be a growing homeless problem. Okay. Um, Mr. Franson. The homeless problem is uh, obviously a complex issue. I think that we need to have a plan as a community, as an organization, um, to help those who want help and can be helped. And with that, then the people that need other assistance, like maybe mental um, assistance or other help, kind of tough love, you know, they might need to go to jail. I don't know. but. Um, we do need a plan, and I think with the homeless shelter that we, ha that we have and that we're proposing, um, we need to really look for making it a Turlock shelter. Um, we do get funds from Stanislaus County, so the word out in the street, I've talked to them, is that we're attracting all these people, and some of them I do think we need to have help, and that's why maybe a daytime activity requirement for the shelter so that they are actually doing something productive and so that we can help them. And then those who don't, aren't willing to go through the system, then we need to help them in other ways. I support uh, what the Public Policy Center here at Cal State Stanislaus is doing through our federal grant, and that's uh, reviewing information, interviewing people, uh, gaining information to report back to the council on the homeless situation and proposals for addressing it. Um, I think there is a need for some sort of a shelter, whether it's run by the church church groups, faith-based community, or um, uh, other entities. But we definitely have a homeless problem here in town. The, the challenge is that some say it'll be a magnet to, for other communities to send here. Um, how do we balance that? Well, I believe we have to move forward as a community, including the business community, the neighborhood, where the proposed shelter may or may not be, and um, citizens. Uh, because Turlock has been known for its um, uh, number of churches per capita we've had here. It's been in the Guinness Book of World Records. And if we can't show a little empathy and provide for those less fortunate in need, I, I think we can't be true to our 
our, our reputation in the world. Thank you. Mr. Vandewein. I think there is room in Turlock for a shelter. Uh, I'm not convinced that government should be the provider of that. Now, it, when we talk about the homeless, we're talking about several different subgroups of people. We're talking about the economically displaced, people who have lost their jobs because of an injury or they've been fired, and they've lost their home as a result. These are the people who can use the resources of government to get referrals, get education, get, uh, get the leg up that they need to get back on their feet, get productive again, and get housed again. Uh, there's also the mentally ill and drug users. There are resources available to help them uh, through, the, through the government. But we've also got a class of people here who, who mi mingle in, mix with the homeless, and uh, kind of camouflage themselves. And these are the people who really are probably in the greatest need of all. And that's a need that government cannot meet because government does not even acknowledge that their level of need exists. It's the level right here. Um, Specifically to your issue, I think we need to advocate with the state and make sure that the state is making you whole uh, in terms of getting your money back. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Sixbury. Uh, Mr. Ken Fitfield. Good evening. I'm representing the Chamber of Commerce. Um, we've all talked about the need for growth in the city and that growth is inevitable coming to the city of Turlock. And, and, and all of you have shared um, partially your ideas about where the growth is going to occur in the city of Turlock. Given the inherent infrastructure, um, where the infrastructure currently is, the freeway, uh, water and sewage, um, how do you support uh, growth in the city? Where do you support growth in the city and why in relationship to our current infrastructure needs and some of the inherent problems of going to the west side, going to the south side where there's a lot of ranchettes and, or, or going north of Taylor Road? Okay, um, I, I will state again that I believe that we really need to look and plan to go west. Um, obviously the south side's already been started, mentioned. I don't believe that was a wise move and um, because Delhi is coming north, we're going south. We've always talked about cushions in other communities, so that sort of contradicts that right there. The um, lander and 99 interchange is really messed up. We need to come up with some money to fix it. And um, if the developers are going to do that, then I guess the plan is for them to provide that, which I don't see happening. If you go west, a lot of a lot of the traffic problems are already solved as far as the interchanges. Some improvements can be made. Developers can cover that um, by providing more area to grow. That also brings down prices. If we have limited lots, then obviously they get expensive. Um, the freeways valuable land. I think that commercial should be by the freeway, not industrial. Um, that's, I mean, traffic's, you know, expensive. Well, I, <clears throat> I don't support going west with housing. I think um, what we have done in terms of allowing commercial hubs to uh, be built around the interchanges is fine, but in terms of housing, I think that the west side of the freeway represents some of the primest farm agricultural land um, around here and that uh, growth should go to the south southeast area of Turlock where uh, farming is less um, uh, prominent, the soil is not as uh, good and um, even though there's smaller ranchettes I think uh, that's part of your um, master planning and uh, slow growth uh, advocacy because it takes developers more time to parcel those things together and get them together they just have to do their job it's not easy money. Um, I think also with uh, the south area represents uh, an opportunity to work with the federal and state government and a new e interchange uh, being built to coordinate the Hilmar Bypass, which would possibly come down um, Griffith Road. Also, looking south to UC Merced, there's opportunities to partner with Merced County in that area as well. So I think there's, there's exciting potential for the south area of Turlock, and I'm looking forward to encouraging uh, that discussion as mayor. Mr. the Biden. Highway 99 is our main transportation corridor, and to date, Turlock has taken an, an unbalanced approach to growing around it. We haven't grown around it. We've only used it on one side, grown to the east of it. And in doing so, we have placed ever-increasing burdens on our existing roads. We've handled it, handled it and handled it well, but we're reaching a point very soon without some significant improvements like the interchange. Uh, we're going to have some impacts that are going to be uh, really cause us to come to a standstill with regard to our development, with regard to our economic development. And I do not support continuing to stuff our 
economic future into one corner of the city and stifle our, our ability to, to take care of ourselves as a city, to provide for uh, the needs that we have, to generate the revenue. It's rational. We've set a rational border as Taylor as our north border. We can set a rational border to the west, say Washington, for example, as our western border. Um, these are rational things we can do and make the best use of both sides of 99 and, and, and reach a balanced approach to how we grow. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Hiddenfield. Mr. Butler. Proposition uh, 90 is on the November uh, ballot on eminent domain. Uh, what is your position? Do you support or do you oppose uh, that proposition and why? Um, actually, I do not know too much about that proposition. Um, so I don't want to actually you know, say anything that I don't know about. I'd have to study that as I'm studying a lot of issues. Um, so hopefully these guys can shed some light on that. Well, I oppose it. I think it's a power grab, and um, I think that uh, it will throw uh, throw something that shouldn't be thrown into the courts. Uh, uh, it would it would make local government uh, uh, just in shambles. I, it, it's something that shouldn't be uh, accomplished, not the way it's been uh, written. It is a poorly written proposition. Uh, the proposition that Senator Tom McClintock had been proposing was a much better law, but he lacked the finances to move it forward, and as a result, Proposition 90 is the one we're stuck with. I, while it has a lot of emotional appeal, uh, eminent domain is uh, an issue that generates very strong emotions in the public, and that's unfortunate in this case because, I've got to say, it's probably not a good idea to take this one uh, to uh, accept this proposition as the solution because it's not a solution. Uh, it creates more problems, I think, um, than, it, than it purports to solve. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Gibson. Good evening again. We have a number of vocational classes in our schools, high schools. What might the city be able to do to help us teach those vocational programs and also provide mentors for our students who would like to get into some of those trades? I think that's, uh, um, that's a good subject. I, I'm totally for partnershiping up with, um, with basically the future of Turlock. Um, I think that the city of Turlock is a great place to teach people in an actual work experience. So um, I would totally facilitate some kind of internships in um, all the areas of the city of Turlock, we can, I mean, we can take anyone wanting to do anything because we have all those positions. I would really um, look forward to doing that. I'd like to. I, I, I agree. I, uh, one of the things that I enjoy is uh, the Rotary uh, vocational days right. and uh, career days. And, and um, I think that's just very important for our youth. And when I was in high school at Turlock High, I was a vocational student myself. So I believe in it. And I think, yeah, as, uh, as um, my colleague here says, I, I would support those efforts. I think it's a great idea as well. We have so many different jobs available uh, that we, that we, so many areas that we cover in terms of jobs in the city of Turlock that there's a lot of different opportunities for students of many diverse interests to gain a lot of experience and then also partnering with the university and the, the internships that I'd like to develop there. We get a broad cross-section of people from the professionals who are doing the job right now through the collegiate uh, realm and then down into the into the schools so that these kids not just see what's available in terms of work, but also what's in ter available in terms of education. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Milt Richards. Good evening, everyone. I believe that the three of you support Proposition K, but I noticed that several of the candidates for city council do not. What would you say to them, and how would you try to convince them that uh, Proposition K is the, or Measure K would be the right way to go? Actually, I don't support Measure K. Um, I actually support Turlock, so um, I think that it's a easy sign-on, quick fix thing. We see a million plus dollars, and of course we want that. Um, I don't think it's a solution to fix our streets, uh, our repair and maintenance needs. We're seventy-five million dollars behind, so obviously that didn't happen overnight. Giving us a million plus, three million, five million, I think it's it's a prioritizing issue. We currently spend zero dollars out of our general tax fund for streets, which is one of the biggest complaints we have. Um, I would say that Turlock needed to um, stand fast and almost not sell out and possibly look into a combination of population and revenue 
that we generate to get money back. I know that was looked into, but they agreed to go with this um, this calculation based on just population. I think worst comes to worst, we could have our own half cent tax and get all the four to six million dollars a year, and we can use it for anything we want. So. So that's our. I, I do support Measure K, and I, I think it's wrong not to be uh, a part of that uh, process and support it as a city simply because we will become a self-help county and that op uh, opens opportunities with federal and state revenue sharing so we will get money to do need things that we need to do with roads and, and interchanges and freeways. Uh, Turlock will get a new interchange at West Main uh, improvements around there as well as 1.7 million for roads and potholes and fixing things and we need to we need to move forward and get our our money to do what we need to do, and I support it. Mr. Van Der Unfortunately, people are focusing on the limited amount of money available to cities for street repairs, but it goes much, much farther than just street repairs. And for any community to rely on Measure K to repair their streets, it's not going to happen. There's not enough money in the entire pot just to take care of Turlock's lean needs and alone. But what we need to focus on is the fact that this will allow us to leverage other monies, the state and federal monies, so that we can improve our transportation corridor. And when businesses and industry are looking for new places to locate, they're looking for several different factors. One of the most important is transportation. The, avail the availability to move goods and services into and out of an area is a key attractant for them. And when we see Turlock with a West Side Industrial Specific Plan right off the freeway with prime access and perhaps corridors going all the way across to I-5, all of a sudden these businesses, these industries are going to take a good hard look at Turlock and that's one of our main selling points along with the university and along with Turlock Irrigation District in our enterprise zone and then fist is up and I have to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Breathe. Now we I have <laughs> wonderful editor from Signal, yes, our student uh, newspaper. My name is uh, Christy Mayfield, and I'm a student here at uh, California State University, Stanislaus, and uh, I write for the Signal. And um, all of you have mentioned at different points um, in tonight's forum that you want to make yourself very accountable and very accessible. Um, and just the incident that, that you spoke of earlier, the concert being canceled, uh, Speaking to many of the students here on campus and even some of the um, the other students at neighboring campuses, a lot of them feel that there's a lack of communication between leadership and the student body um, at the neighboring campuses and, and particularly here on campus. What would you do to establish um, maybe a more effective rapport with the students? Well, I would first say that we as far as leaders actually need to get down and actually be part of the community, which involves the university. Right now, the university is like their own little community. People don't know what's going on. Um, I get press releases all the time from uh, the university for my business, and it's like people don't even know what's here. So I think that we need to promote the university. I think we need to promote the, and I'm a stereotype, but the stereotypical university student. Right now, the concert was a perfect example. It was like a preemptive, like what could happen. And you, it's really not fair to do that to students. And the students here at the university, from what I've heard, are um, on an average a little bit older, too. So I really don't think that's right. I think that we need to embrace you guys, that you need to be out here in the community also. You got to do something, and not just on your university campus. And we got to come here, too. So. So those are. Well, um, I think we'll do a better job in, in embracing the uh, university, but the university needs to do a better job of encouraging and, and welcoming the, the city and the residents of Turlock to the campus, and under recent leadership they've done that. Um, I'm happy to hear that we're going to have a new um, uh, parking structure here. And one of my, my pet peeves has been there's been inadequate parking, and, and you have to park way far away from the university events and walk, walk in, and, and it's not friend, uh, user friendly. So I'm happy to see that that opportunity will exist for more people to come and visit the university. But um, I, I'm proud of our relationship that we've developed. I, I'm happy to hear that we're going to have outreach in the downtown with the new film and uh, television uh, studio and uh, the re relationship with Dr. Schiavone. Thank you. Mr. Vandewey. I may be uh, letting the cat out of the bag, but I understand there's some preliminary plans for another concert this spring. And already uh, some of the student leaders have approached me and, and the chief and said, you know, we want to get way out in front of this thing and make sure that uh, we've got plenty of communication going on. And that's, that's really what needs to happen. Uh, your student leaders have taken the initiative now and they're communicating with us and, and we've got the contacts, we've got the relationships. 
set up already. Uh, the, the chief has already got an open door policy with them, and and uh, that's what needs to continue. It's the building of relationships and the opening of lines of communication. That's what needs to happen, and it has to be active. We can't just sit there and wait for the phone call to come in. We have to go out. We have to reach out and establish those relationships with the leaders, the president, the leaders on the Senate, and uh, from that we can really build what we need in order to have a more interactive community. Thank you. I think you. Uh, we're coming to the close, so I'd like to take advantage of a uh, little time we have and um, ask uh, one more question before the closing uh, statements. Uh, we don't have the time. <laughs> Apparently I was told that I, okay, I'll leave my question for after. Okay. Uh, so we're going to stop here and uh, we start with the closing statements. Mr. Franson? Okay. I'd like to close with a positive note. Um, I want to thank all the supporters of pretty much all the candidates um, that have been very positive, that haven't been making spectacles of themselves and us. Um, I really have enjoyed this first um, attempt at uh, running for a mayor. I would ask that everyone educate themselves, inform themselves, not only about me, but my other uh, colleagues here, because I want whoever wins to have full support of the Turlock community. We really need to start deciding what we're going to do. We're at crossroads. I really would like to ask that everyone vote for me, DJ Franson, because I'm trying to improve the communication and interaction so that all of Turlock gets represented. Um, whether or not which way I vote, at least I can be able to point to and say how and why I voted. I think that's missing right now. And I'm trying to take the politics out of this position. I just want it to be fair, honest, and um, basically represent our community and help make Turlock as great as it's already been. Thank you, Mr. Franson. Mr. Thank Lazar? You. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here tonight, and I appreciate the opportunity to, to join my colleagues in this discussion. Um, I'm running for mayor of Turlock because I believe I have the, uh, the uh, experience needed to lead our our city forward in the next uh, four years. I welcome the opportunity to answer questions such as this and meet with people during this uh, campaign. And I have to share with them, and they'll, they'll probably agree with me, that it's not easy running for public office. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a big commitment, and uh, we put, through, put our families through a lot to do this. And um, uh, I think we all have a, um, a calling to do this and want to serve and do what's right for our community because we love our community. And um, Turlock's been good to me and uh, the Lazar family, and I, I want to give something back, and that's why I'm running, and I hope uh, I can count on the support of many people out there watching today. Thank, Thank you, sir. Mr. Van der Weyden. Thank you, President Trevani, for organizing this event where we have come and, and share our Pleasure. views with you and the, and the viewing audience. Um, I'm looking forward to being mayor. It's going to be a fun four years. And uh, well, I, I should take the opportunity right now to dispel some rumors that have been flying around town. It's been said that I'm looking at doing this for two years and then running up for an assembly seat. And I can, I can assure you and the rest of the rest of the community that is that is absolutely false. It will not happen. I'm looking forward to running for re-election in four years. This is a community in transformation. Um, the leadership is transforming. The community is transforming. The administration is transforming, and I think the public has higher expectations now. They are wanting more. That's why we're seeing so many council candidates. So that's why we're seeing this this number of uh, uh, candidates for mayor. And uh, I'm looking forward to being your next mayor. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We appreciate your coming, and thank you so much for giving us your uh, uh, time and, and energy. Thank you all for participating in tonight's candidate forum. Uh, venues like uh, this encourages voter participation and provide information, important information I might add, to assist voters in making informed decisions at the ballot box. We here at California State University Stanislaus wish all of you the best of luck in campaign and in your future endeavor, all the candidates. Uh, remember to tune into the university's local cable channel for live uh, election results and commentary on November 7. The results show will be co-anchored by CSU Stanislaus Professor Larry Giventer and former Modesto Junior College Professor Randy uh, Siefkin. Um, have a great night. Thank you and good night.